Hello everyone and welcome to International Women's Day. I'm known to many of you as Catherine Duggan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at FIP and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, offer you all gre greetings for today's session, Shaping the Future of Self-Care Through Pharmacy. The event today is health, care, health and self-care literacy for the management of minor ailments in the pharmacy, with a real focus on women's intimate wellness and health, which is important for all of us. Next slide, please. So my name is Catherine Duggan, as I've mentioned, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer. I'm going to hand to my colleague Dahlia now, who's going to introduce herself. Good afternoon, um, good evening to our colleagues on the call. Thank you so much, Catherine. My name is Dahlia Burgess at FIP. I am the lead for provision and partnerships, and I am delighted to be joining this um, call today, this webinar, as a co-moderator. I will later be introducing our um, esteemed guests, our speakers in this session, uh, uh, joining um, my, my CEO, Catherine, um, to, to proceed. Thanks, Emilia and Catherine. Um, I'll hand back to you to proceed with your opening remarks. And happy International Women's Day, everyone. Thank you so much, Dahlia, for that. And we'll just give a few announcements now. Um, so colleagues, those of you who are very well, um, very well acquainted with our events today know that we're recording this and live streaming it via YouTube. So people can access this after the event. The recording will be available on our website at www.events.fip.org. Please use the question box to ask us questions and, of course, chat to each other through this great day. And then you can provide us with some feedback at webinars at fip.org. And please, if you'd like to become a member, if you're not already, then please visit us um, at our website again to investigate the uh, membership options for you. A little bit of a, an acknowledgement to the um, funders of this work. This webinar is sponsored through unconditional funding by Reckitt. Thanks a million. So before introducing the new programme and today's event, it's really important for us to take a moment to reflect on today. Very important day, 8th of March, International Women's Day. And today is a celebration of the achievement of women in various fields, including science, technology, engineering, mathematics, sports, many other fields, and pharmacy notwithstanding. Um, I, for one, I'm always humble on a day like today to recognize as the first female CEO of the Federation, just what a great privilege this position is. And I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge and celebrate the progress that all women have made especially those in pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacy education. I'd also just like in a day of celebration and reflection for us to recognize that many are undergoing ongoing struggles. Uh, women still face many issues such as gender gaps in pay, education, healthcare, pain management, representation. So today, International Women's Day is a call to action advocating for gender equality, gender equity, uh, policies and actions that promote women's rights and women empowerment to take charge of their lives and for us all to support them in breaking societal barriers. We stand in solidarity and we thank all of the men who support us in our endeavours to thrive in our workplace and in our lives. Thank you all. So then we want to introduce you to this new FIP series, Shaping the Future of Self-Care Through Pharmacy. And we really understand that empowering patient self-care not only improves health outcomes, but it reduces the burden of diseases and improving health and self-care literacy is therefore absolutely key to empowering pharmacy-based self-care. It's especially important when it comes to the management of minor ailments through pharmacy. And we know that women pay uh, play a fundamental role in self-care, not just for themselves, but also for their families and for those they care for. Comprising of five events, this series focuses on common health issues and the new digital programme aims to examine how pharmacists can be enabled to improve health and self-care literacy. 
approaches for five different areas of minor ailments. Uh, that term in itself needs a little bit of work because they don't feel very minor when you have them will be discussed, including embedding health and self-care literacy into education and training, developing self-diagnosis and self-medication protocols, widening access to patient information and improving referral strategies. So taking place on today, Women's uh, International Women's Day is our first event of the series, Health and Self-Care Literacy for the Management of Minor Ailments in the Pharmacy, a focus on women's intimate wellness and health. Pharmacists play a critical role in improving health and self-care, and particularly in literacy in women's health and intimate wellness, including closing the gender health gap. By improving health literacy, pharmacists can help women make informed decisions about their health and lead to better health outcomes. And with us today are some experts in women's intimate wellness and health to help us know more about the topic and also to guide us how pharmacists can be enabled to empower women through literacy. So we have the uh, learning objectives for you today. Today, we aim to understand the key clinical issues and literacy needs when it comes to intimate wellbeing and health in women, to identify strategies for pharmacists to enable health and self-care literacy for women more generally, to discuss um, enablers across education and training, care protocols and services, access to patient information and re referral strategies. And it gives me my great pleasure for me to hand over now to Dahlia who will lead us through the rest of the session. Dahlia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Catherine. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Um, I will start with our first speaker, Ms. Sovo Miyamele, who is a pharmacist and lecturer at the Swahini, at the, sorry, at the Swahini University of Technology in South Africa. In addition to her pharmacy skills, she obtained a Master's of Science in International Development. She has worked with governments and international organizations to advance women's access to quality healthcare. Sovo is working with the African Union's Development Agency as a technical expert to improve primary healthcare services in underdeveloped countries. Her work was recently um, recognized by the South African government where she was awarded a national award for her work in healthcare, women's health and diplomacy. Sovo, the floor is yours and welcome. I'll be introducing Luna shortly after your presentation. Thank you, Dalia, for the presentation. So we are going to start with my presentation. I'll just share a few bits. Anyway, happy International Women's Day to everyone. I forgot to do that. So um, I'll be talking about health and self-care literacy. That is the case for women. So you, um, when you think of women, you must also appreciate the status of women in society. The status that would be you describing that women experience a variety of social issues that affect their literacy or healthcare access. That would be, for example, class. So class would cause a divide amongst women with the fact that there's women that are high earning and those that are low earning or not even earning an income. Then there's a geographical location. If a woman is in one part of the world, they are more likely to have access to better healthcare and also to better literacy tools than another woman who is on another part of the world. And uh, culture as well divides us because in some cultures, women are not allowed to have a voice. They're not allowed to, uh, to make decisions or may have access to, uh, to things that would advance their health care. In terms of that, there is the historical marginalization of women. So the, the uh, historical marginalization is something that was at a global context. You, as you would understand how we experience COVID <laughs> at large scale. So is the historical marginalization, which was a common thing that was, exper that was experienced. And right now we are still 
dealing with the roots of that. So although um, women would be divided by class, but then in terms of society, for example, within society, just by the mere fact of a woman being a woman, they do not have access to the same rights. They don't have access to the same um, social status as men. And also that would differ again in terms of geographical location and the culture. So also economic, that women were not allowed to have an active role in the economy, where the economic participation that is largely looking after families and looking after households, it was actually looked uh, down upon as opposed to men that would be allowed to work. Then there's the political aspect of it, where women were not allowed to run for political positions. And after they were allowed to run, they were still not allowed to vote. And then there's also within healthcare, where the diseases that are being attended to, it's diseases that mainly affect men. But then you would see that in, in terms of addressing um, healthcare needs, things like menstrual health, you know, menopause and so on are not in the, um, they're not in the uh, primary um, conditions or primary things that are being looked out for within our healthcare system. So when you go to the next slide, I just want to, um, on the next slide, I just want to show the statistics of what is happening around women. As you would know that today's International Women's Day, we've got this special commission on the status of women that is taking place in New York right now. So in this slide, I just want to give you a brief statistic. Um, uh, 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 it's a brief view of what is happening out there with women. I went to heads, one is a pharmacist and then another one is an um, um, advocate for women's health. So this is from the organization called Women Deliver. This is one of the biggest organizations that looks out for the rights of women within society and also in healthcare, which I am a, um, I am a member of. So um, when you look at this, um, I just took out statistics that I feel that as pharmacists we can relate to and also we can improve or work hard to improve. Around 218 million girls and women have got an unmet need for modern contraception. And when you think about modern contraception, that is something that we can easily provide as pharmacists, whether we are pharmacists that are in the developed world or in the developing world, we could be the advocates for that. And then there's 12 million women who are unable to access family planning um, services because of the COVID pandemic. So when we had the COVID pandemic, there was a disruption in the supply services and also um, in, in, in the access of, um, of, um, of, of services and also products for women. And then we, um, this resulted in having around 1.4 million unwanted pregnancies. And this is a ripple effect in the sense that we now have got 45% um, of abortions which are unsafe. And also the leading cause of death for women is complications during pregnancy and childbirth. And to begin with, this would be unwanted pregnancies. But then because we have got a limited reach to women and also a limited reach to provide um, uh, services uh, such as contraception, we end up with these scary statistics. So, if you if you look at um, wh what would what it would require for us to be able to reach these women, if we were to contribute about nine US dollars per person annually, then we would have sixty seven million fewer unintended pregnancies. And we would have 2.2 million fewer newborn deaths and also 224,000 fewer maternal deaths. So this is what Women Deliver is advocating for, that while we're working as healthcare professionals, it's the things to look out for. So when we go to the next slide, you would look at the uh, basic rights of women. So the rights for women are there, but then they're unfortunately not tangible for most of the women in the world. That means that it's 
it, it's there, you know that it's your right, but then you cannot reach this right that is available or is supposed to be available to you. So globally around the world, women are still uh, protesting and arguing and saying that we need opportunities, we need education, we need access to healthcare, we need employment, we need equal pay, we also need leadership opportunities. And this is a subject that has been sparked as well in the healthcare fraternity, that within the healthcare fraternity, we just have too many many men that are leading and women are not present there. So when we go to the next slide, um, we look at health literacy. Why do we want, uh, why, why would we want our patients, our women to have literacy in health? We want women or patients to be empowered. So an empowered patient is key for the health system to function efficiently. When you've got empowered patients, you've got patients that can hold health professionals accountable because as much as we are healthcare professionals, the, the health services that we provide are not necessarily always of the highest quality. Yes, we do try, but then there are uh, gaps and also loopholes in the system. So when you've got an empowered patient, then they hold us accountable. And Empowered patients are able to take ownership of their, um, of their health. When the patient is empowered, whatever interventions you give to them, they're able to sustain them. And also we've got improved healthcare, the healthcare outcomes, for whatever interventions we would implement. On the next slide. The key clinical issues that women are dealing with as a species on their own is they're dealing with sexual health. And unfortunately, because of the society that we live in, which does not really provide a platform for us to have a voice, this is usually ignored then they deal with reproductive health, especially adolescents. I cannot stress this enough. With adolescents, they are unable to access healthcare services that are available to them. So even when the, the system has been de designed for them to access um, contraceptive services, it's still unreachable for them. They also, um, we would also need to look at uh, breast health. We need to look at urinary tract health also menopause, mental health, and gender-based violence. On the next slide. So when we um, improve literacy amongst women, you, you find that improving literacy amongst women, you would want to take the approach that was taken when there was advocacy, um, well, it's still happening that there, are, there is advocacy that is happening around teaching a girl child. So when you teach a woman or you empower a woman, you make them more health, lit uh, uh, health literate, then you are able to, number one, have an impact on their family which surrounds them. Then you're also able to have an impact on the village that they live in. Because it's believed that when you give a girl child an education, you don't only educate them, you also educate their family, you educate their community. Women are carers of children. So when you empower a woman with, um, for self-care, in terms of healthcare, you empower their children indirectly. You also empower the men that are around them because they are the carers for their husbands, they're the carers for their parents, they're the carers for the elderly as well. On the next slide. The considerations that we would need to take for improving health, lit uh, health literacy amongst women is that number one, we need to address the healthcare disparities. I think that we can all agree that there are disparities in the type of services and also the excess of services that are available to women. Women, especially those that are located in disadvantaged communities are unable to access healthcare. So when you want to improve health literacy, health, um, health literacy you must look at those disparities. You must also um, have gender specific information. Um, with that in mind, although you would want to have gender specific information, you need to be conscious of the cultural sensitivity and the information that you provide must be relevant and then it must be easy to understand for women 
depending on where they would be based. You must encompass the women's health needs. You need um, to look at the unique needs of women. For example, an adolescent uh, girl needs information and they need assistance about reproductive health while an elderly woman or an adult would need information about menopause. And all of this information is information that we can provide as a pharmacist. We need to promote self-care practices. So it's widely believed that for us in the healthcare fraternity, we thrive on um, people that would be sick. So it, it's always nice that we have a... Um, we, we have a preventative approach with each and every intervention that we would want to employ to correct health. So that is empowering our patients to exercise, to eat healthy, to have healthy eating habits, to live healthily, and also manage their stress. And we need to provide support for their mental health. On the next slide. So the role of a pharmacist in all of this is that the, the, the pharmacy, I mean, during the COVID uh, pandemic, it was very well established that we as the pharmacists are actually the most accessible health professionals to patients. So we need to take advantage of that. Patients will come to us regularly seeking advice on medicines and other health needs. We must be able to not only be reactive to those needs, but we must be proactive as well. By us being proactive, we would need to provide for brochures, we would need to have pamphlets that are easy to understand. So just because you've got a brochure or a pamphlet or um, information sessions, if it does not make sense to the patient, then why are you doing it anyway? We would need to offer health literacy workshops. We would need to conduct intervention research and also um, information research because it's important for us to have data. It's not only the data that we get from uh, uh, global organizations like the UN or the World Bank that we can use, but then within your small community, within the place where you're operating from, you need to collect data so that you know how to assist your patients and also to, um, uh, to facilitate for them to be able to, um, uh, to be literate in their health. You would need to have a multidisciplinary collaboration that, is, uh, that will enable you to provide comprehensive health care, and it will also increase ex access to resources and also improve the health literacy of your patients. On the next slide. So in conclusion of my presentation is that when you speak of self-care, women are not the pharmacist patient only, but then they're also our partners. And we need to appreciate that about them because of the impact that they have within their families, in their communities, and wherever they operate from, they're our partners in health. So we, if we want to make a difference, we need to appreciate that about our women. And we also need to empower them to be able to, um, to, 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 to be literate in their healthcare approaches and also to provide health care for the people that they look uh, that they're looking after wherever they are. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Dalia. Thank you so much, Sobo, for that enlightening presentation. I'm sure that some of our listeners will have some questions for you at the end. So we'll, we'll save those until we have that discussion. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker and colleague, Dr. Luna Ilbizri from Lebanon. Luna received her PharmD from the Lebanese University in Lebanon and has a marketing degree from the American University of Sciences and Technology. She's a current PhD candidate in public health at St. Joseph University in Lebanon. And she is the founder and manager of Luna Farm Pharmacy and a clinical associate professor at the Lebanese International University. Luna is known to uh, many of us. She is um, an executive committee member uh, for the FIP Health and Medicines Information Section, 
Hamas. She um, also leads uh, research in the field of sexual um, and reproductive health and has many awards and publications in this field. Luna, welcome to the webinar and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this really lovely introduction. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, today I'm going to talk uh, in more specific way about the woman health intimacy rather than the sexual and reproductive health. And uh, I will talk from my point of view as a community pharmacist and how pharmacists can play an important role in this. Next slide, please. So to start uh, with, we have to understand that women intimate well-being is a journey. It is really a continuum of care that will start uh, around the adolescence, will continue throughout the life of the, the woman till after the menopause. And during this journey, the woman will, will come across a different touching point that there she has to know what is the best choice and the best decision for this condition. Most important touching points are the intimate hygiene, menstrual blood problems, vaginal discharge, and the genitourinary syndrome uh, at the moment of the menopause. Next slide, please. But if you want to have a good uh, decision from the woman, what is the uh, problem? What are the main barriers? My colleague has started talking about different barriers, but I will give you some concrete example from the community pharmacy. So number one, as the biggest barriers, is the culture and religion, and, and religion. Lots of communities won't accept women to talk about their body, their sexuality, and their libido. Religious faith and culture influence intimate hygiene behavior. You can see, for instance, a, a, a woman that a friend, maybe a mother telling her, this is a personal problem, only discussed at home only discussed with your partner. So you do understand how societies, culture and religion can implement. Another point is the gender. So you do have gender bias communities. Generally, lots of communities are with the man rather than with the woman. And you can see also the woman that will prefer to go to uh, and talk about her sexuality with a female pharmacist rather than a male. For, for, uh, uh, and then we have also a third uh, barrier is that in many countries, in many, if you want communities, access to health information is forbidden to women. The third barrier is age. You can see at my side, someone telling a young woman a girl, if you want to, telling her, you are not married. You cannot talk or think about these things. So you do understand how this is, uh, 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 how the, gender, the age is a barrier. At the opposite, when this woman will get her 50s, she has to expect to have these symptoms. She has to suffer ab about her vaginal atrophy or about her uh, vaginal dryness or her decreased libido because she has to expect these symptoms. Next slide, please. Another uh, barrier concerning the woman is the socioeconomic status. As you have seen, we have this stigma. You should not discuss intimate health everywhere and, and openly. And always, always, poverty and conflict. Lots of study had shown that they will exacerbate gender discrimination against girl, girls and women. You can see this woman telling, I am embarrassed to talk about my private parts. This shaming, this embarrassment that is uh, uh, reflecting the presence of a woman, especially if he is a male, as we have said before. How about the lack of education? Unfortunately, always lack of education is accompanied by not talking, by this taboo surrounding intimate health. And you can see adolescents and young girls not able to talk about their problems uh, of, of sexual and reproductive health. Now we have talked about the biggest barriers for women, but how about healthcare providers? 
And today you are talking about us, the pharmacists. Well, one of the biggest barriers is the lack of training, skills, and resources, because sometimes pharmacists doesn't know how to talk about a self-care intervention, how to educate women. They will feel discomfort. Maybe they have these biases, even if they are the pharmacist, and they have this lack of sensitivity, and they can discuss it openly sometimes. But what also is very important that if the pharmacist, the community pharmacist, doesn't have time to talk about these things. He has lots of things to do. And most of all, he is doing this for free. They are not remunerated. The incentive is not there. So these are the biggest barriers. Let's see in the next slide what we are going to talk about. Now, I have taken an example to see if a woman is not educated by a simple uh, uh, topic, which is the female hygiene practices. I have selected a study in Lebanon talking about female hygiene practices among female patients and nurses here in Lebanon. And you're going to see that a simple female hygiene practice may impact her, her intimate well-being. For instance, we have seen that in Lebanon, vaginal douching is uh, is practiced among 15% of the patient. This number here is relatively low, but in a lot of studies, this can blow up to 75%, for instance, in certain African region. And uh, for the feminine, uh, feminine wives, the use is very high, almost 44%. For us in Lebanon, you, the use of feminine deodorant spray is not very common to tell you the truth because it's not in our culture, which is important to talk about it. So women were thinking that they have the best female, female hygiene practices, they, they are cleaning themselves, they are happy about it. But what they don't know, what are the effect of, uh, effect of these practices? They don't know that they are predisposing themselves to bacterial vaginosis, to pelvic inflammatory diseases, sexual tra transmitted diseases. They are having vulvar dermatitis sometimes. They have allergic reactions. So you can conclude that lack of awareness among women can lead to different adverse effects that can be, if they are well educated, can be avoided. Next slide, please. So can, how can health literacy improve intimate health and well-being in women? Of course, education education and education, good understanding of what's going on, sexual transmitted, transmitted diseases, how there are, trans, what is the transmission? Uh, we have seen that with vaginal douching, we can have this transmission, for instance. Good intimate hygiene, what is it uh, as effect? The effect of puberty, pregnancy, menopause, and detecting the early signs if they know about infections, urinary tract infection, fungal or vulvovaginitis. So when pharmacists play an effective role in sexual and reproductive health education, women will be empowered and they will be able to understand and what is more imp uh, 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 important to use the information to make for themselves the best choice and decision. So we are offering the good training and education and then they will do this, the decision that is the best for, the, for them. Next slide, please. So education, training, self-management support, you will lead, it's all this will lead to empower the woman, woman to take self-care intervention, the best one for them. And this will lead to improved outcome, such for instance, uh, decreasing the recurrence of UTI, the, uh, the, uh, avoiding allergic reaction, decreasing uh, itching, et cetera, and et cetera. Next slide, please. So here we are in the community pharmacy. I am a community pharmacy. What can I do to help these women and support them? Many things. First, we have to have these women intimate wellness products. For instance, the wash, the intimate hygiene wash, lubricant, moisturizers, etc. Over-the-counter supplements, 
you are asking why supplements or supplements such as cranberry or, or probiotics because we want to help this woman who has a problem for instance in their vaginal atrophy and dryness to reduce the the bad bacteria and to improve the good bacteria to 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 have a cranberry to, to reduce the recurrence of urinary tract infection so first of all you have to have all the women intimate well-being products second you have to have the services. If you have the products and the woman doesn't know how to choose and what to choose, so you are doing nothing. So it's very important to have an appropriate self-care advice. You can do an aware scale, a campaign. For instance, as you can see uh, down, a menopausal vaginal atrophy and learn about an awareness campaign about that. You will help them to know what are, UT what are UTIs, how to avoid them, you can talk about them in uh, about intimate skin care, but the success for that, so they're not they're going to feel embarrassed or ashamed, is to have a confidential private consultation room. You cannot expect from a woman to uh, talk about her intimate skin care in front of everybody or about her vaginal dryness. So this is very important. You have to have. A, a, a very private consultation room. Next slide, please. Finally, we have to have many tools. I really like the use of pictogram. What is the pictogram? This is one that you are seeing about the vagina discharge. Women, whether they know how to prescribe or they don't, whether they talk your language or they don't, because you have refugees, sometimes they don't talk your language. Maybe I am talking Arabic, they are talking, I don't know, another language. So what is the, the easiest one is the use of a pictogram. She will simply just show you how is the color of her vagina discharge. And then after that, you can uh, ask more questions to understand. Pamphlets help. Posters help, especially during awareness of, or, or if you want to invite women to be in the consultation room to talk about their problem. Use of technology is very important because you can use social media, they can email you, WhatsApp messages. What is important also to build the trust, build the trust between you and your, your patient. Because if you are a male pharmacist and you want to talk to a woman pharmacist, to, to, a, woman, to a woman, she has to feel that she is secure and talking to a, to a professional. Discuss what they have to expect as adverse effect, what is important to educate and empower. But at a certain moment, it is important to know when to refer. And that's why interprofessional collaboration is very important. Next slide, please. Now, we have supported our women, but we need to support also our pharmacists. Because in community pharmacies, as we have seen, we need training. Training about female intimate wellness, as well as about, of course, sexual and reproductive health. For that, pharmacists within their pharmacy need continuous educational training to enhance their communication skills because they have to know what and how to talk with women. It is good also to look after the pharmacist assistants and to give them uh, trainings according to their needs. Number two, which is very important, are governmental regulations, legislations, policy changes, because some, in some areas, dispensing of simple UTIs is forbidden to, to, to pharmacists. This is the case here in Lebanon, for instance. We need to have access to medical record because you want to know everything about your patient to help her or the woman that you are, you are dealing with. Finally, we have to prepare our future pharmacists because these pharmacists, these students now are the pharmacists of tomorrow. So what is important, not only to talk about, let's say, hormonal contraception, they know what is hormonal contraception. They have to know how to talk about it. So they have to know how to have a social cultural competency, how to talk to, to, to a refugee, how to talk to uh, an old lady, etc., etc. So sexual reproductive health learning, and they, they have to understand what is self-care intervention? And now we are moving from just talking about a patient-centered care to talk about a person-centered care. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I am showing you 
two illustrations. The first one showing the most important antimicrobial infections in women, the fungal infections and the UTI. Fungal infections, as you can see, the lifetime risk is about 70, 75%, and the recurrence risk is about 10%, 5 to 10%. While for the UTIs, it is 60% as a lifetime risk, and the recurrence risk is about 50%. So you do understand that simple, good, intimate hygiene, uh, intimate uh, well being can di make differences, especially for the recurrence. Also, you can see that the market of the intimate hygiene product is now about 21 US billion dollar globally, and it's going to be around 28 in 2025. So we are using a lot of intimate hygiene product and regularly, but we have to know what is the best daily cleansing uh, routine, not to just to, to, uh, use, let's say, vaginal douching or others. So preventive strategies, understanding causative factors and detecting early symptoms may greatly improve patient care, quality of life, and reduce antibiotic use in case of UTIs or antifungal medicines in vaginal yeast infection. Last slide, please. So my last thought are empowering women and helping them to choose the best decision for their case is really the ultimate goal of the community pharmacist. Rising female literacy and awareness can improve feminine hygiene and wellness. But what is also very important, decreasing stigma and discrimination is key to women empowerment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luna, for that fantastic presentation covering um, some of the most important barriers in women's intimate health, but also delving into some of the strategies to support self-care in this area. Uh, we look forward to also taking some questions uh, for you in the panel discussion. Thanks a million. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce another FIP colleague and friend, Dr. Jack Collins from the University of Sydney, Australia. Jack is a practicing community pharmacist and a lecturer in Sydney at the University of Sydney. His research interests include self-care, mental health, health policy, and health equity. Jack is an ex-co member of the social and administrative pharmacy section at FIP and was the 2018 recipient of the FIP Young Pharmacist Group Award for Professional Innovation for his work exploring implicit bias in pharmacists. Jack will talk about the gender pain gap in his presentation. Welcome Jack and the floor is yours. Thank you very much Dahlia and hello everyone. A very happy International Women's Day to everyone on the call today. I would like to begin by acknowledging all women in pharmacy, pharmacy education and pharmaceutical sciences, women who are in FIP, including at FIP HQ and some of the FIP staff, as well as the women in our lives. Obviously, I'm not a woman, I'm a man. I would like to acknowledge the privilege that comes with that, but also the important role that men can have as allies when it comes towards continuing to strive for gender equity as well. Secondly, I would just like to mention that the research and information in this presentation refers to women primarily as those assigned female gender at birth. And I would like to acknowledge the unique challenges and experiences of people who have diverse gender identities. So thinking about the pain gap, we need to first have a little bit of a think about what pain itself is. As a condition, pain is invisible and complex. We can't see it, it's very hard to quantify. There are many different types of pain that people can experience and they are influenced by numerous factors. As we can see in the diagram on the right, we have many social factors, biological factors and psychological factors as well. It can be incredibly difficult to quantify pain and, therefore, and it can also be highly individual. Two people could be under the exact same circumstances but report pain to be quite different. Therefore, it makes it very difficult to manage as clinicians. When we're looking at pain in women in particular, 
Women can experience pain in different ways, such as they may be more prone to chronic conditions, particularly autoimmune conditions, of which chronic pain is a common feature. There may be biological factors which women have, which may influence their perception and experience of pain. And they may also experience pain which cannot be experienced by men, such as menstrual pain and childbirth pain. Therefore, it makes it very difficult for men to be in a position where they can empathise and really have an understanding of what their female patients are going through. As we've heard already in the presentations as well, women are often the primary caregiver for others in their family, and those people could be experiencing pain. So they're not just managing their own pain, they're also more likely to be in a position where they're reporting pain on behalf of others or assisting others that are in their care to manage pain. So what is the gender pain gap? Essentially, if we put it in a nutshell, evidence suggests that women may receive less intensive, less effective and lower quality management of pain compared to men. This is drastically perpetuated by stereotypes which society may attribute to women, including the fact that women dramatise and overemphasize their experiences of pain. They have a bit of a, they might be perceived that they have a tendency to over-report pain or they're more likely to report their pain than men. They don't accurately report their pain, so that comes in and have a dramatising, you know, making out that the pain is worse than it actually is. And also negative stereotypes saying that, well, women are just less tolerant to pain compared to men. All of these are not necessarily true, but these are kind of attitudes that clinicians can have as well as the general public. And this can result in both underestimation and undertreatment of pain on a global scale. This is not unique to one particular country or practice environment. This is something that we can see all around the world. And this is what we refer to as the gender pain gap. Bias plays a significant role in the gender pain gap, or at least we believe it does. This is one of our best explanations. Broadly speaking, we can classify the type of bias we're looking at today into explicit or implicit. Bias is our tendency to favour one group over another. It can be positive or negative. If we think about explicit bias, that would be overtly sexist attitudes and comments. Someone might explicitly say out loud and believe, well, women are just weaker than men. But what if I was to tell you that it's actually possible that you could also think that without necessarily knowing that you're thinking it? So this is where implicit bias comes into it. The Cohen Institute in Ohio State University um, defines implicit bias as the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions, which are all relevant to clinical pain management in an unconscious manner. It's activated involuntarily without our awareness or control, can be positive or negative, and everyone is susceptible. So this means to say that although our explicit attitudes may not be women are weaker than men or they're dramatizing their pain, subconsciously when our brain gets into really quick thinking, that is what could be processing. And that's a learned behavior and something that society kind of trains us into thinking. And what does the research tell us about the gender pain gap, pain gap and um, some of these stereotypes that we might hold? Thinking of implicit bias specifically, unfortunately, healthcare profession professionals have just as much implicit bias as the general public. We know that for a fact. A systematic review um, of a large number of studies found that practitioners tended to view uh, male patients as being stoic, was they would use words to describe women such as hysterical, emotional, complaining, or even in the worst case scenario, they might have said women were making up the pain that they were reporting. In that same review, interestingly, when they focused on what treatment women were given versus men, women were less likely to receive effective pain treatment, despite the fact they were presenting with the same condition as men, and were also less likely to receive opioids. Interestingly, they were more likely to receive antidepressants and mental health referral as a strategy for managing their pain, rather than other uh, means of pain relief which were given to men. So we can definitely see that practitioners are approaching it differently between the genders. In this little interesting study here, um, I think it was about 200 university students were asked to reflect on a uh, time where they had experienced pain and describe it. And the authors did this with the intention of explicitly looking at the differences between how male and female students described their pain. Based on what we've just heard, we would expect to see that women will probably use really 
emotive language, perhaps be a little bit dramatic in their descript descriptions, whereas men will tend to play it down. Interestingly, this study found that women were more likely to describe their pain in more words and describe it using more um, informative markers of their pain and descriptors, which could actually be used to aid clinical management. Interestingly, men used fewer words, less descriptive language, and they were the ones that tend to focus on events and emotions. So we have this uh, tendency to think, oh, well, women are going to be very emot emotive. This analysis of the way that people describe pain has showed that it was actually men that were more emotive and less articulate. So now that we know this exists and it can, could be an issue in practice, what can we do as pharmacists? So one of the best things we can do is educate ourselves about the gender pain gap and our, reflect on our own implicit and perhaps explicit biases that we might hold. We need to challenge those biases and practice reflectively. We can think, did I subconsciously do something? Is it there a chance that I could have this implicit bias? The likely answer is that you do hold it. So we need to kind of train our brains out of that, slow down our thinking and make more deliberate choices and actions um, to make sure that we're not letting those implicit impulses in our brain influence our practice too much. It is very tricky and there's not really an overnight fix, um, but we have to try our best. Educating your colleagues is another great thing we can do about the gender pain gap. So now that you know it exists, you can go into your workplace and have a discussion with colleagues about it to try and see, uh, try and inform them and minimize the impact it can have from your colleagues as well. Consider what is within your sphere of influence. We can't fix the world overnight. We can't influence the practice of a whole bunch of other people. What we can do is those people around us, such as our colleagues um, within our direct sphere of influence, we can challenge their stereotypes that they might have. Ask, why did you give X patient this medication, but not this patient? And so on to really unearth some of those ideas and conceptions that we might hold. Something else we can do is probably to consider what kind of language we're using as well. Another study, which I didn't include, analyzed clinical notes um, and what wording clinicians used when writing down pain reports. And they were more likely to use those kind of negative associations of pain when, um, when documenting pain described by women compared to when they documented pain described by men. So we can really reflect on some of our own practices and start to make the change um, from directly what's within our influence. So how does this all tie in with self-care? Women may present to the pharmacy seeking self-management for pain, both for acute and chronic pain, either for themselves or others in their care. We can really embrace this as an opportunity to engage with women, take a really thorough history and conduct a pain assessment. Luna showed us some fantastic pictograms in the area of intimate health a little bit earlier. There are similar pictograms that you can use in pain as well, which could be quite useful in this situation. If this woman has been dismissed and her pain hasn't really been taken seriously by lots of other practitioners, you could be the first person in that chain of events to really take the time to understand that individual woman's circumstances. One of the best things we can do as well is really acknowledge that the person's experiences of pain are real and valid. So understanding it and also thinking to reflect that it's individual. So the pain that you experience is not going to be the same as the person in front of you, nor is it going to be the same as another patient who's come in two hours before with the exact same um, circumstances. Pharmacists can definitely upskill on the different types of pain that are frequently experienced by women and the management strategies, particularly I'm thinking menstrual pain here really making sure that you're up to date with the most contemporary evidence and what options are there. So women might be given one or two options. They may not want to take those options or it may not be most suitable for them. So work with women, really talk through the different manage management strategies. You know, this didn't work for you. What else can we try? Has someone talked to you about X, Y, or Z? Um, are there a whole bunch of different options that haven't yet been explored because the pain has been dismissed? Absolutely, one of our greatest strengths as pharmacists is to act as a triage point. We're very accessible, but it's we're also very good at knowing where is the point where I need to refer this person to someone else. So if you think that there's really poorly managed pain or something's been overlooked by practitioners, be an advocate for the person in front of you. Refer them to a medical practitioner, perhaps with some written communication around what your concerns are or a phone call to them. Final thing I want to mention is that if this is an area that interests you, we had a discussion panel in Seville last year during Congress 
um, where a number of people, we had a bit of a roundtable discussion around what we knew about the gender pain gap, how we might manage it in pharmacy, what does it look like in education. This QR code will take you right to the uh, reports that you can have a read for yourself. I'm also going to try and pop the YouTube link in the chat. There we go. So we had a webinar in January where we launched it as well. So if you'd be interested in learning more about the gender pain gap and hearing some of the discussions that we had, you can follow that link or look for it later on the FIP YouTube channel. So I would like to acknowledge everyone that was involved in the gender pain gap discussion, um, the fantastic FIP staff as well, who wrote up the report and helped facilitate the discussion. And finally, Dr. Jonathan Penn, who did a lot of the groundwork in the research for FIP in this area. So thank you, everyone. Jack, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation addressing the gender pain gap and how it ties in with self-care and pharmacists being the first port of call to support women um, manage um, their pain experiences. Thanks, Emily and Jack. It now gives me a more great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for, for today's webinar, our colleague Lere Andraka from Spain, who is a community pharmacist with a master's degree in pharmaceutical care from the University of Valencia. Since 2018, Lere has been coordinating a women's health working group under the Spanish Society for Clinical, Family and Community Pharmacy, CEFAC, which has focused training and research of pharmacists around perimenopause, menopause and genitourinary symptoms. Lere will talk about practical tools to help pharmacists address health literacy and women's health and intimate wellness. Welcome to the call and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon and happy International Women's Day to everybody. Next slide, please. I would firstly like to thank FIP for this opportunity to participate in this interesting webinar and thank Dalia, Dalia and Noor for their kind presentation. Mm -hmm. Most of the things I was going to say in my presentation have already been exposed by my colleagues but in my case, I would like to talk about, you about practical tools we can use here in Spain to help pharmacists address health literacy and women's health and intimate wellness. The World Health Organization defines self-care as the ability of individuals, families, and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. It's well known that self-care is effective when undertaken by individuals, but when people count on healthcare providers as pharmacies to guide them and give them support, they are able to achieve even greater benefits. And that's what we are going to explain and what we are going to manage. In many communities and small villages in Spain, pharmacies represent the first point of contact within the health system. And as such, they play an important educational role. Their advice, we know it's essential for community health and self-care. Pharmacist capabilities relating to self-care include disease prevention, immunization, detection of diseases via point of care testing, and the management of chronic diseases. Health literacy skills allow patients to take control of their own well-being by making good healthcare choices or, and improving their communication with healthcare professionals. It's a fact that people with low health literacy tend to abandon self-care and seek advice from a physician earlier than necessary for self-limiting minor ailments. The Spanish Society of Community Pharmacy has contributed with the healthcare literacy on female intimate wellness by participation by participating in collaboration with the Spanish gynecologist independent society in the elaboration of the guideline for good intimate hygiene practices. That's what we got in the slide. It's a very practical tool we often use to counsel women about hygiene and to educate patients on the adoption of healthy lifestyle habits, as well as addressing concerns and dispelling myths regarding such habits. CEFAC also developed two training courses for community pharmacists and for pharmacy technicians focused on perimenopausal symptoms 
and a full chapter in both of them deals with vulvar vaginal symptoms, non-pharmacological and pharmacological management, and defines red flags we should always refer to the doctor. This chapter is based on the Spanish Association for the Study of Menopause and the Spanish Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics Genitary Syndrome Guidelines. It is a very practical tool when giving advice to women who ask about irritation, itching, dryness, sexual problems, or urinary discomfort in the pharmacy. Next slide, please. Last year, the Spanish Society of Clinical, Familiar and Community Pharmacy Foundation promoted a public awareness campaign in community pharmacies which pretended to inform population about vulvovaginitis and urine tract infections and their most common symptoms. Here you can see the pamphlets we could provide to our patients, which included some tips and recommendations on how to prevent and manage both. Don't forget that when interacting with, with patients, it is important to use patient-friendly language and avoid healthcare jargon. It is also a good practice to ask them to repeat in their own words what has been previously discussed so that we can confirm they, they understood our explanations. In order to register patient clinical data and its follow-up when talking about minor ailments, including also female intimate symptoms, community pharmacist members of the Spanish Society of Community Pharmacy can use the digital the digital healthcare platform, CEPAC Expert, which is a very useful tool because it includes a great collaborative procedures, mainly with general practitioners and when to indicate non-prescription medicines with demonstrated scientific evidence to manage these minor ailments. Next slide, please. Some other tools we can also use to educate women about intimate and sexual wellness and which are not specific for healthcare professionals nor for community pharmacies, we can find them on the internet. It is important to give advice to population on where and how to find reliable information concerning healthcare. For example, both Spanish Society and Gynecology and Statistics and Spanish Society of Familiar and Community Manager promote healthcare information on the social network to inform about intimate wellness. These are some of the examples we can see in this slide of documents we can find aimed at women about menopausal genitary syndrome, painful intercourse, or abnormal discharge and vaginal eating. Pictures which describe discharge are very useful at this point. Nowadays, digital content is increasingly growing. Healthcare professionals and pharmaceutical industry are using Instagram, TikTok, or other, or other similar channels and social media to spread healthcare information. Once again, it's important to have a critical view and investigate who is beyond the camera before trusting or expanding the message. It should always be based on clinical trials or scientific evidence. Next slide, please. When answering the question about the, what pharmacists need to know about the topic, I would like to say that community pharmacists need more support in their roles in female intimate wellness. Incorporation of, to of topics such as vag vaginal changes, experimenting when hormonal changes take place or sexual health in pharmacy undergraduates, and in continuing professional development training programs for pharmacies is also very important. Not only knowledge should be a must, but also developing other kinds of skills, such as communi communication skills to support pharmacists in interacting with patients about women's intimate wellness. SAFAC is now preparing in, co in collaboration with general practitioners and gynecologists a training course for community pharmacists in sexual and reproductive, and reproductive healthcare which will include topics as sex transmitted infections in order to give the best professional service to population. Obviously, we will educate pharmacists in contraception, their rights, and sexual transmitted disease prevention counseling. And, how, and also it will include how to detect some of these diseases via point of care testing, like human immunodefense virus and syphilis, for example. 
I hope it will be a good training course for pharmacists and that it will include practical tools to use as health literacy for women when asking for advice on sexual and reproductive health. Pharmacists should also participate, I think that pharmacists should also participate in TV or radio programs, podcasts, or in other kinds of social networks to transmit their knowledge and promote health education and increase health literacy of women, even when they do not come to the pharmacy. I also think there is a need for increased digital health literacy among pharmacists, because it is important for us to understand electronic health records and digitized data, with, which have become increasingly more common and will, even, and will be even more in the future. In conclusion, concerning this concrete topic, I think supporting community pharmacies would definitely help strengthen female intimate wellness and may also help make the health systems more efficient and more targeted. Thank you very much. Please join me um, in thanking all of our guest speakers on this webinar for really um, sharing fascinating um, um, information and um, good practices and strategies um, in this area. And I would like to invite all of our speakers to uh, switch on their cameras, if you may, um, as we would like to now spend the coming 10 to 15 minutes addressing some of the questions that have been posed by our attendees on the call and perhaps share some of your reflections and uh, from your expertise, from your experiences and how we can support progressing the area of women's um, intimacy, intimate health um, and, and, and self-care. So I would like to now um, perhaps um, present one of the questions that um, has been uh, sent to us through the Q&A box. And I invite our attendees um, who are still on this webinar to um, add any further thoughts or questions in the Q&A, and we're happy to take those with our panelists. But one of the questions that we've received, and I will read it out here, is with regards to being advocates for contraceptives, can we also um, simultaneously advocate for knowledge of the side effects that come with contraceptives and really the impactful strategies to mitigate some of the side effects such as weight gain, depression, amongst others that can sometimes um, affect the quality of life of women. I wondered if one of our guests would be willing to um, address this particular uh, question. We can even take turns. Luna, you've got your hand up, and I know that you have some connectivity yeah. issues, but we can see you, we can hear you, and then I'll go to Lere. Yeah, you want, I <laughs> can move my photo because I, I'm no, seeing... No, it's okay, Luna, no problem at all, we understand. Yeah, I, I would like just to answer, uh, first of all, the question from a point of view that uh, this uh, colleague has to understand we're not advocating for, for contraceptives. We are advocating for the sexual and reproductive health, woman empowerment. So the woman, if a woman is willing, if she wants to have contraception, we don't tell her go and take pills. No, we will tell her that we you have many choices. Maybe she wants to use a ring. Maybe she wants to use a loop. Maybe her uh, couple, uh, uh, as a couple, she, they want to use another contraception uh, uh, way, uh, way. But we don't advocate or tell people what to do. We just give them all the tools, and they will have to choose whatever they want to. And yes, it is our duty to tell them what to expect as side effects. And even if, if, if let's suppose she is a lady more than uh, 40, 40 years, we have to tell her about the sexual, uh, sorry, about the side effects that she is going to expect about 40 years. So it is our duty, but what is more important to understand that we don't impose solution. We just give them all the, uh, let's say the choices and they will make the solution, the decision. So this is empowerment. It's not telling them, it's giving them all the tools to, cho to choose. Thank you. Thanks, Luna. Yes, I was, I was going to say the same. 
uh, I think that empowerment is important and they and and women should know and have all the information to be able to choose the the best way of contrap of contraception if they if they want to to use contraception. So they have to have the information and be able to choose by themselves. That's the empowerment. The message is to give options, choices, and not to tell what to do. I would like to um, address a particular question to our guest, um, Sobo, who concluded on her slides that if we want to make a difference, empowering women is an opportunity. That's what you concluded with Sobo. And um, I'm wondering what strategies do you think can be implemented to empower local pharmacists in different countries? to be involved in primary healthcare provision to women in this area. But my question is also twofold about strategies, but also maybe how for pharmacists how to discuss safe abortion needs, for example, and contraception without stigma. So Eva, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, thank you for the, uh, for the two questions. So um, let me first address the first one about safe abortion without stigmatizing it. I think that um, the, if, if, if you, uh, in my slides or in my presentation, I did mention that mostly issues that affect women are stigmatized in a way in general. So the, the, within the healthcare system, the issues that have been addressed well, it's issues that affect both males and females. But then when it comes to things like menstrual health, menstrual pain, as, um, as highlighted by Jack as well, uh, it's things that were just put aside for so long and it's only now that we're opening up about it. So when it comes to uh, safe abortion without stigmatizing it, you need to understand that abortion is a serious issue and many people don't have um, access to, to safe abortion, um, uh, abortion uh, facilities or, and, and that goes across the, across the borders of class. It, 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 it's, you know, sometimes it's location dependent where a country will be highly developed, accessing, having access to whatever technology is required. But then when it comes to abortion, they do not provide those options. The empowerment is just not there for women. So in terms of st the strategies to communicate around safe abortion without stigmatizing it is that we would need to, number one, when you look at abortion, we need to address it in such a way that there is no stigma around it. Because currently we, we look at it as it is being described as many things, described as murder, described, it, it has var various translations, you know, uh, uh, when you reflect in, in terms of a religion, in terms of society, popular culture and so on. So we would need to look at it as an unmet need when we talk about empowerment, because empowerment is about there being a need and then providing the options. So that is how we would start with it. It's, it's a need that is there in society. Women do want um, a safe uh, uh, abortion facilities and safe abortion services. That is where we start off from. And then in terms of empowering the pharmacist, I think that, um, in terms of the pharmacist, we as pharmacists, we are healthcare professionals who are supposed to have knowledge. That is where it starts off from. We're supposed to have an abundance of knowledge. And from that abundance of knowledge, we share with everyone else. We share with the communities. We share with our, um, with our patients. So if you're a pharmacist that is located in whatever area you're working from, you would need to make sure that you have got access to, to the correct information and empower yourself. So yes, we do want to empower pharmacists, but then because you have gotten to the point where you are admired as a leader within your community by virtue of you having a bachelor of pharmacy degree or whatever degree you might be having, you would need to look for the information yourself. 
you would need to um, uh, to educate yourself. And then uh, from the side of FIP, what you're doing right now, this is an empowerment that we make the messages heard. We, we inform our colleagues in the area that there is such a webinar happening. How do you access it and how do we share the information and make sure that it's available to everyone else to benefit from? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sovo. I've, I've experienced some connection um, issues here, but I hope that you can still hear me okay, everyone. Thanks yes. for that. Thank you for your input, uh, Sovo. I am going to move to our guest, Jack, with uh, a question that's on some of our minds, perhaps. He um, has mentioned an FIP report that examined uh, pharmacist responses to the um, gender pain gap. And Jack, I just was wondering um, from this particular experience and also your experience in research in this area, whether you could share with our listeners today um, some of the best practices that pharmacists may adopt when delivering um, pain management advice to that okay. Yep. Sorry, Dala, we just lost you at the end, but I think I got the, the gist. <laughs> um, when it comes to pain management, I think that what I was flagging earlier around each individual's experience being incredibly different is something that we really need to consider. So a thorough history taking and really trying to understand what pain means for that individual at that point in time. Pain is dynamic, it's not static. So it could be fine one day and not the next and not the next. So I think taking the time to really focus on the individual in front of you, person-centered care, what's going on for that person at that time, knowing your pain options, and also not being dismissive. So just because something has worked for one person and it hasn't worked for the person in front of you, choose something else. What else can we try? What are that person's preferences as well and what fits in best for them? If they want to try a non-pharmacological approach or some other kind of measure that may not be in your usual repertoire of what you would recommend, discussing the pros and cons of that and really working with individuals to see um, what might work best for them. And really just understanding, particularly in the case of women, and sorry to go back to menstrual pain, but it's a big one, they if they have quite severe and debilitating menstrual pain due to conditions such as, say, endometriosis, they may have gone a long time, a number of years, with people being quite dismissive of the pain that they're experiencing. You know, women who menstruate, well, mine's not like that, it's not that bad. So, again, really understanding the journey and taking whatever presentations of pain that you have in front of you as serious and genuine. Thank you so much, Jack. So I think from what we've heard so far from my guests, just on those previous questions, some key words, um, which are in relation to an individual's preferences, well-informed and joint decision making, uh, providing them with choices, um, being aware and reflective of our own implicit and maybe even explicit biases when we are um, addressing this particular topic of self-care, and um, being really mindful of some of the barriers that Luna covered in her presentation, particularly around culture, religion, gender, that could perhaps be in the way of um, really empowering our women to, um, to, to really address their, their health issues. But I have one, one question, and perhaps in relation more to education and professional development of pharmacists. And I, might, I may direct this to Luna and to uh, Lere, but Jack and Sovo are very welcome to also intervene before we move on to the concluding remarks from our CEO, Catherine Duggan. Colleagues, we've been talking about how much we need to empower pharmacists with knowledge and to upskill. And I, we can also almost say that we need to educate the educators before moving on to our students to normalize this topic and starting out from undergraduate education and pharmacy and all the way along to professional development as Larry has um, uh, mentioned in her presentation. But if I was to perhaps, you know, build on what 
uh, what Noevo spoke about, which is in relation to access to safe abortion contraception and the need to address this, um, as you have rightly pointed out, Luna, in your presentation, by providing the right education, the right advice regarding menstrual, uh, regarding menopausal health and well-being, which is still stigmatized in many parts of the world and um, also associated with a large amount of misinformation and cultural barriers to even talk about hormone replacement therapy, for example. How do we see addressing this from a pharmacy curriculum point of view, uh, um, colleagues. So Luna, Larry, would you like to maybe just men talk about the undergraduate and the continuum of education for pharmacists? Again, sorry if my connection is coming and going. Uh, my connection was also the same. I'm really sorry. So uh, I will tell you something very important that pharmacists know about, let's say, contraception. They know about, uh, as they know about, for instance, antibiotics. But what is really uh, missing is how to address pharma, uh, uh, patients or women. We don't have to have a patient now in front of us. Maybe we have person, maybe we have a community. So what is important to teach these undergraduate uh, uh, future pharmacists is really uh, first uh, cultural uh, differences, how to respect this culture, how to do it, uh, when to address it, what are the tools? We have to give them tools. So whenever they are in the community, uh, they, they know how to use these tools. Number two, what is important when, when we are telling them or teaching them about sexual and reproductive health, it's not only molecules or let's say it's not only hormones. It is how they have to address and counsel the, the person that is, is in front of them to tell them what are the choices, what are the expected side effects, what is the best thing for them? Because sometimes uh, uh, I, I, in my community, I swear to God, I found women taking hormone replacement therapy after 12 years because they didn't uh, come back to their physician and they are still in taking this hormone replacement therapy at 65 years of age. And this is very important because they have to have all the scenario. What I suggest also is the internship to have an internship specifically in, in areas where uh, uh, we discuss sexual and reproductive health. It is very healthy also to teach them uh, uh, how to go to, to even beyond the walls of the community pharmacy, to go, for instance, uh, schools, uh, universities, and to teach these, these youngs about the best tools in sexual and reproductive health. Thank you. Hello. Yes, I completely agree with Luna. I think it's important to include this kind of topics in undergraduate pharmacy, but include also communication skills, as Luna said. And uh, we have to go to the to the educational to the education to adolescents to to people that really will 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 have a. a a good, a good education and a better education in contraception and sexual health care. If we go to them, uh, we have we most of them don't come to the pharmacies, so we have to go to them and to and to um, educate them in the in in the skills and the healthcare um, management of this kind of topics. Health professional scientific societies should collaborate closely in the development. Of continuing of continued education courses for professionals also working in community health, including communication skills, as we already said. I think that this uh, would permit population to reach a better health literacy and improve self-care of individuals, which are not the community, but just the individuals. Perhaps governments should support access to medical records of pharmacies. And, and pharmacy services is contraception and sexual health care counseling in this kind of point. Thank you so much, Lyra and Luna. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of summing up now. Uh, I fear I may not do a great job because you four have just given us so much to think about. But I, as I'm listening to you all, I think we need to normalize some of these conversations, even within our own families and friends. Uh, when I think about 
how little in my family or within my friend groups we would discuss issues around menstruation and now menopause. The world is very different now. And I, I really pay a big tribute to you, Jack, for, for really addressing the issues around what's normal in terms of pain or discomfort and thinking it might be normal for you. Uh, I also would just urge colleagues to for us to support women in their journey with um, their menstrual health and intermenopause because normalizing it too much or dismissing it too much can really dismiss situations which could impact fertility and could have been identified earlier on. So thank you all so much for your openness. So Dali, I'm just going to do a couple of summings up before we um, say a big thank you and before I hand back to you. Health literacy and self-care literacy for the management of minor ailments in the pharmacy. I don't think anything we've discussed today is particularly minor. And I don't think they're ailments particularly. So Dalia, I think for us, we need to learn how to describe these. Maybe our colleagues can help us on the call. Normalizing our conversations at FIP. Sovo, you spoke about women as partners in the wider issues of health and self-care for the family. This reminded me of a publication we did in 2018 around women and responsible use of medicines and just the the like the fulcrum role that a woman plays in the family um, and may actually diminish her expression of what's normal for her or dismissing her own symptoms. Luna, you were really open about the discussions that um, really need to be had, wide and broad issues around intimate health understanding, age, gender, culture, but also the particular moment in someone's life, like being a refugee, being a young woman, uh, being an older woman, which uh, some of us might find that ourselves in that position without realising it. Very good, frank, open discussions around managing intimate conversations around these issues. And then, Jack, your revolutionary open understanding and openness around biases and influences, even us as healthcare professionals, and even as the only man on our speakers list today, you stepping into the space of questioning biases means that we feel more empowered to question our own biases as well. And Lyra, you outlined the crucial part pharmacists play in all our communities. I felt like you were the person who said the doors have to be open at whatever stage in your life. And we heard at other events quite recently that one of the beautiful things of a community pharmacy um, is that people can go in and have an intimate conversation if they need to have one more privately. They may not go to their local community pharmacy, but they do trust their community pharmacist. We just need to enable them to trust us everywhere. Um, I really loved the way that all four of you identified how pharmacists play a critical role in this area as empathic, empowered and informed healthcare professionals as self-care ambassadors. And I've really taken a note to myself to think about my own biases in this area um, as a pharmacist, but also as a woman. And Jack, you've really been a beacon to us. I thank you so much for your championship of this. This is not just a woman's issue. These issues are people's issues and we need to step into that space to normalize them. Um, and I really loved it, Luna, just how open you were about all the stages of a woman's life and how hiding, either discussing things or how you may um, practice your intimate uh, hygiene is just it's just storing up problems for the future potentially so I really welcome it and so the, the discussions around abortion as well which are very sensitive and very um, we have to tread cautiously cautiously here but that doesn't mean we should avoid those discussions so I thank you all really I don't think Dahlia it's a problem only for education I think there's an issue here for information misinformation uh, Reinformation is an issue not just for our academic colleagues, but our community pharmacist colleagues, but actually, Luna, you know, our colleagues in Hamas, our colleagues in social administrative pharmacy. What about advocacy to our governments? Because as you say, Lyra, being part of the healthcare system and the healthcare team would enable pharmacists to have all that other healthcare information and to document these. I thank you all. And I thank you, Dahlia and the team for opening up this very important issue which for too long, I fear we may have tread, trodden around and not faced and not discussed. Um, and I just think it's a real testament to all of you for your health professionals to help us with this on this day. Um, Dahlia, I hand to you to close, but I think we all know now we have more to do at FIP for this issue. 
and that together, shoulder to shoulder, we can really empower women through literacy in this issue. Thank you so much, colleagues, and happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, what a fascinating discussion this has been. And on time, we um, are now just wanting to point out um, and welcome people to consider coming to Brisbane, Australia for the 81st FIP World Congress uh, of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, which will be held in September of this year. Um, please note those important dates on the screen for abstract submissions and even the early bird registration deadlines. We look forward to seeing you there and we look forward to seeing you at subsequent FIP digital events you can always check out um, our digital events calendar on our website. And thanks a million, everyone, for attending. But special thank you to our CEO for including remarks, to our amazing four speakers. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, FIPHQ, for the back end support. And um, good day, everyone. And happy International Women's Day again. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you very much.